Are you all ready to get into the scriptures? Yeah. I love this. We're in a series entitled Applied Relationships. So it's a relationship series. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to eat. Well, let's, let's go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. That's going to be our foundational verse. We're going to kind of take off from that. That's, uh, that's going to be our, um, our takeoff ramp. Uh, and so um, last, last uh, Sunday, we talked about the, uh, the aspect of trust in our relationships, the importance of trust in our relationships, how vital and critical that element is. Uh, when I was in my 20s, in my mid-20s, I, I met a, an older pastor, minister, missionary, and he made a statement to me uh, in passing, and I don't, of course, this was like, I was in my mid-20s, so that was like 100 years ago or something. Um, so I don't remember exactly what the context of it was, but I never forgot what he said. And he said, I don't work with people I don't trust, and I don't work with people who don't trust me. And when he first said that as a 24-year-old or whatever, I thought, oh my goodness, that's really se severe. I mean, that's extreme. Uh, and, but the longer I, I've lived and the longer I've been in ministry and the longer I've you know, been developing friendships and relationships and as time has gone by, I recognize that even though the way he said it may not have been the, most, uh, the easiest way or the best way to say it, it really makes a lot of sense. What he was saying is, is that there's nothing that, that, that we can do once trust has been broken in a relationship. It's freeze-framed. At best, it's just stalled at that point. So what we said last weekend is that God's love will hold a relationship together. Make, God's love will make sure that that relationship doesn't completely disintegrate. But it's only trust that can allow that relationship to move forward. And so what he was saying is, is that it wasn't like he was mad at anybody. He was saying that if that element of trust is gone, if people don't trust me, there's nothing I can do about that, uh, especially if I haven't done anything to betray that trust. And, and of course, if once that trust is broken, it's very difficult. It can be rebuilt, but it's very difficult to rebuild. And so, uh, and the other thing that we, we looked at with that in mind is that once we are uh, willing to do the hard work of rebuilding trust, and that's specifically what I want to continue to talk about today, we, rebuilding trust starts at the same place where it was broken, which is the place of honesty. So anytime trust is bruised or damaged or broken, it all has to do with dishonesty. It has to do with lying. It has to do with misrepresentation or, or, de, or deception or deceit in some way, Right? And so if we're going to rebuild trust, we have to go back to the place where it was initially broken, and that's at the place of honesty. So what we talked about last week was embracing a, an honest life, beginning to speak the truth. That's why I asked you to turn to Ephesians 4, where Paul the Apostle says, stop telling lies. Don't be a liar, liar, pants on fire. How many of you all remember that? Most of you don't. Let us, let us tell our neighbors the truth. In other words, Paul was telling the church there in Ephesus that if, if your relationships are going to be strong, if your relationships with one another are going to be able to grow, if you're going to be able to experience God's presence and God's strength in your relationships, they have to be grounded or there has to be a foundation of truth in those relationships, right? Because trust can never extend itself beyond truth. Now think about that statement. Trust can never extend itself beyond truth. So where truth ends, trust ends. Right? And where truth and honesty is, is, is abundant, guess what? Trust is abundant. And where truth and honesty is scarce, then trust is very, very limited if not completely broken. And so Paul says that that's, you know, it just starts with that, that, that sincere life that we talked about last week in Philippians chapter 1, where uh, the love of God causes us to live a life that's sincere. And we, we looked at how that word sincere in the Greek language literally means to be sun-tested, S-U-N. I'm not going to go into why that is or what that's all about. That's, you can go on our YouTube page or Facebook page or website and get last week's message or as we explain a little bit about that in more detail, but what it means to live a life that's sincere, but it's a life that's honest. It's a life that's genuine, that's authentic. And then we began to talk about some of the elements that are necessary in rebuilding trust. And there's one that we just touched on 
that I, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure last week I said we were going to have to come back and, and kind of uh, spend a little bit more time on it. And that is this. And, and, and here's the thing. When we're, when we're rebuilding trust, there's, there's, there's several elements that are important. There's one in particular that we're going to look at, and it's the one element that is the most uh, overlooked in rebuilding trust. And in some ways, it's one of the most difficult ones because it has to do with the element of time. In other words, once trust has been broken, that happens in a moment, in an instant. But then the process of rebuilding trust doesn't happen as quickly as the process of breaking trust. Right? You break trust, it can happen like that. Right? If, if you have a friend and they've stolen money out of your purse or out of your wallet or they've betrayed you or whatever in some way, uh, how many of you would agree with me that you don't just gradually become uh, troubled by that? The relationship isn't just over time impacted by that. It's immediately impacted by that, right? You know, and so, but to rebuild that trust, that, that element of time is one that is overlooked so often. And here's why. Because typically, the person who has broken the trust, they want to rebuild the trust, but most of the time, they want that process to be faster than anybody else, especially faster than the person who was betrayed or hurt or their trust was broken, right? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? And so I want to take a few minutes to talk about that because here's the thing about that process. You can't speed that process up. In other words, if I'm needing to rebuild trust with someone, uh, and, and I'm committed to doing that, I have to be committed to the amount of time that that, that that might take. And I have to realize that I can't speed that process up, but I can certainly slow it down. And how do, how do I slow it down? By pushing the person to trust me quicker than they're ready to. Because oftentimes what I've seen over the years is, you know, a person repents, they, they, they own it, they take responsibility for it, they're genuinely broken over it, they want to rebuild the trust, but they, they, they want, you know, it's like, hey, I, I repented, I, I, look, I'm doing better, it's been a month. Come on, trust me. The other person's like, ah, we're going to need a little bit more time. What are you talking about? The Lord's forgiven me. Well, forgiveness and trust are two different things. Right, everybody? Forgiveness, well, it's not always instantaneous, but forgiveness comes usually, in the, well, actually, it needs to come before trust comes. In other words, it's impossible for a person to rebuild trust if the other person hasn't forgiven them. So forgiveness comes first, but forgiveness and trust are two different things. Trust is strengthened. Trust is earned. Trust is reestablished. But it always takes longer than we want it to. But there's this process that's a part of it. Uh, that, that, that's a part of the rebuilding of the trust that is necessary for people to see. There's a, there's a completeness or a wholeness that will come back to the relationship only if we're willing to go through the process of time in rebuilding the trust. In other words, the time the time, the process, is necessary for the relationship to be completely whole. See, if we try to shortcut that process, then there isn't any, there's not complete healing in the relationship. Here's what it says in James chapter 1. Let patience have its perfect work, that you would be perfect, or that's better translated, mature, that you would be perfect or mature and complete and lacking nothing. Let patience have its perfect work. The Amplified reads this way, the Amplified Bible. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience, patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be fully developed with no defects and lacking nothing. So when we're reestablishing or rebuilding a relationship, we want it to be whole. We, want it, we don't want any defects. We want it to be fully developed. We want it to be complete. We want it to be right, right? Okay, and so the element that's a, that's a part of that process is just time. 
So it says, let patience have its perfect work. Let patience have its perfect work. The word patience in that passage, well, it's used several times throughout the New Testament. It's illustrated several times. And, and, but, but let me just say, suffice to say that that word in the original language means patience, means be, having, being willing to or having the willingness to stay underneath the pressure of something. In other words, when the pressure comes on, this word patience means that that individual, if they're, if they're allowing patience to have its perfect work, that means when the pressure is on, they're not trying to alleviate the pressure. They're not trying to get out from underneath it. They're willing to stay underneath that pressure until they've completely gone through the process and, and whatever needs to be developed or healed or restored is exactly that. It's developed fully, it's healed, it's restored. And so there's always pressure involved in that. There's always pressure on our soul, pressure on our impatience. But the word patience means we're willing to bear up underneath that. We're not looking for a way to escape that or make it come faster or make it come easier. As a matter of fact, everything in the kingdom of God involves this this idea of process where we learn to see time as a friend instead of an enemy. I've heard young men say, man, I, I got to get into the ministry. I hold you. I'm 24 my whole life. Stop. I became the pastor here at 52 years of age, way past what you normally would think is, you know, it, it was kind of like being on a football team and, ha- and having a bench full of all these young black-haired men, and then there's me with gray hair sitting on the end of the bench, and the coach says, all right, Faylauer, you're in. And I'm like, do you realize how old I am? (laughs) I should be getting water for everybody. What are you talking about? But being able to see time as a friend and not an enemy is the beginning of that, but everything according to the scriptures, according to Jesus, everything that has to do with the kingdom of God has this this element, this process that, that we have to recognize the sacredness of. As a matter of fact, Jesus described it this way in Mark chapter four. He says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna stop there. In a, in, in a few moments, what we're going to read, when Jesus says for the kingdom of God, what he's saying is, is this is, I'm gonna describe to you how everything in God's kingdom works. So, that's a huge statement, right? <laughs> the kingdom of God is, this, is, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, sleep by night, rise by day. The seed would sprout and grow. He doesn't know how it does, but it does. For the earth yields crops by itself. Now look at this part. First the blade, then the head, then the full, then the full grain in the head. And when it's completely ripened, then he goes in with a sickle and he harvests what he's planted. But Jesus is describing, there's a lot in this passage, but the one thing I want to highlight when we're talking about the idea of patience and the idea of time and the idea of a process and how important that is, he says, this is how God's kingdom works. This is how everything in the kingdom of God works. This is how God created it to work. It's like this. It's, you've got to plant the seed, but once you've planted the seed, it's not like Jack and the beanstalk. Remember that story? It's not like that. He says you plant the seed and it begins to grow, but it grows slowly and there's a process involved. First the blade, one translation says, then the ear, then the full corn, then the full head, and then the harvest. But it's a process. What was Jesus saying? You want to know how great marriages are built? Just like this, over time planting seeds, and it takes time. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. How how are great churches built? First the blade, then the ear. How are great companies built? First the blade, are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? How are great lives built? It's built over planting seed, being consistent, but it's over time. I remember years ago, of course, uh, this this, uh, entertainer's is, is no longer with us, uh, Glenn Campbell. So many of you, that's my generation, many of you remember him. And when he was at the height of his popularity and height of his career, he was on a talk show and they asked him, they said, well, Glenn, how does it feel to be an overnight success? 
<laughs> he says, if I'm an overnight success, that was one long night. What they didn't know is he spent years and years and years writing hit songs for other people and being a studio musician and trying to get a break and having doors closed and just keep plugging away, plugging away year after year after year. In other words, there's this element of time that we have to understand. So Jesus is saying, this is how life works. You can't speed up that process, but you can slow it down. And here's what's interesting. Jesus used farming, and often when Jesus would describe to us a spiritual truth, he used farming. He used farming. Have you noticed that? And I, there's several reasons why, but one of the reasons why is because farming is a natural system. It's not a man-made system. Now, why is that important? Because a natural system, you can't cheat. You can't shortcut the process. You can't, it doesn't matter how impatient a farmer is once he plants the seed. That seed is going to grow the way it's going to grow. And it doesn't matter how much he paces back and forth in front of his field. It no matter, doesn't matter how long he, how many times he curses the sky. That's going to, his, his crop's going to grow like this over time. First the blade, then the ear. You all getting what I'm saying? And I believe one of the reasons why Jesus used farming so often to describe spiritual truths, and especially how the kingdom of God works and how life works, is because it's a natural system that you can't, you can't shortcut, you can't manipulate it, you can't take advantage of it in any way, unlike a man-made system. So let me give you, a, let me illustrate it this way. There's several man-made systems. Um, our judicial system, which is probably the best system probably in the, in the world right now, but it still has its flaws because it's a, man, it's a man-made system. No matter how good it might be, it's not a natural system like farming. It's a man-made system. So how many of you would agree with me in our judicial system, there are people that are innocent but found guilty. And there are people that are guilty that are found innocent. Okay. How can that be? Well, it be because it's a man-made system. Our political system's a man-made system. I'm not gonna go much further than that because it's such a hyper thing right now, but, <laughs> but, but we know that people get elected to office and we're like, how in the world did that happen? And the best, the, who we think is the best, didn't even get, you know, so all of that, why? But why are there injustices and inequities? It's because those are, na- those are man-made systems, and because they're man-made, man can manipulate them. Our educational system's a man-made system. I know it is. I mean, how many of you, like me, got through school by cramming for tests the night before? Now, all of you know my academic career Staggering 2.0 GPA in high school. <laughs> Stunning. College, went to college on academic probation. And literally looked at me and said, we're not even sure you have what it takes to even be here. But we're going to give you a chance because we like your face. We hope you can make it. But we don't really think you are going to make it. And I did. Somehow. I don't know. How? But I did do a lot of cramming. Anybody ever cram for a test? In high school, college, anybody crammed for a test? Anybody who crammed for a test, did you pass it? Yes. Let me see your hands. Come on. Don't, everybody, don't. This is not, we got to be honest. It's truth. <laughs> now, those of you that crammed for tests and passed the test, if you were to take that test three weeks later, without the benefit of cramming, how many of you are confident you, you would still pass it? No way. Why? You didn't learn it? I didn't learn it. I just shoved it in there and held it in there like the night before long enough so that it didn't leak out, (laughs) you know, and I could take the test. But then after that, it just leaked out. And I don't know. You can actually graduate from high school and just be as stupid then as you were when you first started. (laughs) I'm not making fun of you. That was me. I can remember our son asking me to help him with his third grade math. He said, didn't you go through third grade? Yeah, twice. <laughs> and I still don't remember anything. I did. I went to third grade twice. I, I, yeah, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know how this happened. 
I don't even know how I got a degree. I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> but because our educational system is a man-made system, we can cram for a test, but I guarantee you a farmer can't cram for a harvest. He can't wait to the last minute before, you know, before harvest time. He can't wait a week before harvest time and plant his seed and go, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Because he was goofing off during, when everyone else was planting. He has to surrender himself to the process if he wants to experience the harvest. When we're reestablishing trust, we have to be willing to submit ourselves to the process if we want to experience the harvest, right? Let patience have its perfect work. That word work, I'll just explain it this way. That word work in the original language paints the picture of a woman with child who is going through the nine-month gestation period as that child is developing. That word work is actually translated develop. Matter of fact, one translation says let patients have her perfect work, and that's why it says that. Because that word work describes this process that a woman goes through when she's going to have a baby. And, and I, don't, I can't tell you how many times, how many women I've seen where they get toward the end of that process and they're like, I want this child out of me now. They're really looking forward to it. But they also know they don't want to have that child prematurely. Right? They want that child to have the opportunity to develop, to be whole, without defect, and complete. Does this make sense, everybody? See, God is building something. When we're rebuilding trust, one of the reasons why it takes time is because in that process, God is rebuilding something in us. So we don't have to go back and make the same mistake and break that trust again. In other words, he's developing a character in us in that, and that takes time, but he's developing a character because he just doesn't want trust to be rebuilt. He just doesn't want that person to get to the point where they trust us again. He wants, really what he wants is us to get to the point where we're trustworthy again. Amen? Didn't that make sense? Let's all stand to our feet. Let's all ask God to, you know how, you know how it is when people say, Lord, give me patience. Well, you know what that means, right? The Lord just begins to allow circumstances to happen that, that causes you to have patience. But Father, we want to be more committed to the process than we are even the end goal. We're so results-oriented, especially in our American culture. We're so results-oriented. We want everything to happen so quickly and so fast. And yet, God, there's something that you're wanting to establish, that you're wanting to build to do on the inside of us. Whether we're rebuilding trust in a relationship or whether we're discovering how important it is to be steadfast and faithful and consistent in the meantime, in the in-between time, while we're waiting patiently for your promise to come to pass. So, Father, we just ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would just work within our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And, folks, as we worship with this final song, I want you to know the communion tables are open. You can go. They're in the back. They're in the front. The elements are there for you. You can come back to the front here and kneel. You can go back to your seat. You can sit. You can stand. Whatever, whatever, makes, it, whatever it makes it easy for us to connect with the Lord. But in this final, final moment of worship, Let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Maybe he's going to show us an area where we need to allow patience to have her perfect work. Let's worship him together.